Good evening, everybody. Uh, John Liu, our maintenance deputy, wanted to be here. He had the wrong day on his calendar. He actually even switched his jury duty to be here next week. But since nobody else was going to be here, uh, Paul graciously, uh, Paul Pineda graciously volunteered to give this presentation on roundabouts. Thank you, Paul. Got me out of the <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just short introduction. Uh, my name is Paul Pena, project manager. I do manage uh, some of the roundabout projects here in Kern County, and I'm also the project manager on some of the trip projects and the 99 projects down here. So to begin, I'd like just to show a two-minute video of a new splash about a roundabout that we did in Kerman, the city of Kerman in Fresno in 2014. There it is. Anyway, that, this is the Kerman runabout that's featured in the video. Uh, this was completed in 2014, so it's been in operation for about five years now. Uh, since then, we've had about 12 runabouts that have been built around the district, within the boundaries of the di District 6. As you can see, all runabouts that entering traffic, they yield to vehicles already in the runabout, and you go, and you go counter clockwise. Uh, this shows the uh, roundabout basics. The inscribed circle is the blue arrow. It, it goes from curb to curb. There's the center island. Then there's the uh, truck apron. This is for off-tracking of trucks. That's where they come in. Uh, yeah, that, that allows the rear vehicles of, of trucks to off-track. 
And then the split relents, those are, those are uh, it forces traffic approaching a roundabout to slow down and it, it forces them to turn right. And then they also sell, serve as uh, pedestrian refuge, refuge areas. This is the, uh, the roundabout in Delano, SR 155 and Browning Road. This was completed in, I believe, in 2018. So it's been operation for about two years. This is the uh, roundabout at Stockdale Highway and 43. It's currently in construction, expected completion mid-spring of 2020. This is the one at 119 and 43. It's, it was open to traffic in November of 2019. So with this roundabout and the roundabout at Stockdale Highway 43, they, we expect them to work in tandem and it will allow for a sm smoother flow of traffic on these two uh, BC in, uh, route. Yes, yes. So why, why do we install roundabouts on the state highways? It's mainly for safety. Uh, the main reason is safety. There, uh, there are fewer crashes on a roundabout, and the crashes are less severe. There is a misconception that signals are safer. The problem is on a signal, uh, approaching a signal, the driver would have to make a decision whether to speed up or slow down depending on a, whether it's a, approaching a yellow light. So, and that's what happens when you have that, that often results in T-bone crashes on a roundabout, on, on a regular intersection. In terms of operations, uh, there's less delay. Roundabout moves traffic through without needing to stop. It creates, it, crea it basically creates a free flow intersection with one, with a one-way counterclockwise movement. Entering traffic must yield to, entering traffic must yield to traffic within the roundabout. And also in terms of maintenance, it it's affords less maintenance, less electricians that need to go out there to change the signal in case a, there's a, in case a signal turns to uh, always stop. So we don't have to have, it results in fewer call outs from our, for our maintenance forces. Uh, so roundabouts also serve uh, serves as gateways to communities. And I do have a slide that shows you one such roundabout. And then we started the U inter intersection control evaluation system, or the ICE process, where we where we now we are we evaluate all possible uh, options on what to put on a on a intersection. It's does it not just signals anymore or two way stops or four way stops, which was the usual response to to intersections. So now we 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 basically look at everything that that could any f possible feasible alternative that we could put on an intersection. And so this, uh, this is an important statistic about runabouts. This is from the NCHRP study. So the most important statistic here is the reduction in fatal accidents, 90% reduction from comparing roundabouts to two-way stops, four-way stops, and signals. This is, a, uh, this is a study conducted within the whole United States. So the 90% reduction in fatal accidents and there's part of this study, they looked at nine signalized intersections that were converted to roundabouts, and it resulted in a 48% reduction in accidents and a 78% reduction in fatal plus injury accidents. So why are roundabouts safe? They, they reduce traffic to 15, 20 miles per hour should enter the roundabout. There are fewer conflict points and, the, and it eliminates the T-bone accidents, which are the broadside accidents, which are the worst accidents you can have in an intersection. That's what causes most of the injuries. So this is a typical runabout design. So as you approach uh, 50, 50, 60 miles per hour, you can see the splitter island, it forces traffic to slow down, to start slowing down as they approach the intersection. So it keeps you, it forces traffic to go to the right and back to the left and back to the right. 
where they uh, where they where they entered the intersection. So as soon as so that's why on a roundabout you you'll see fewer uh, accidents and because of the typically slow speed that they go through. But the the benefit is you don't have to slow, they don't stop if there's no traffic on the runabout, you don't have to stop, you just go through slowly. These are the conflict points that we were talking about. On, on, my, on the left is the conflict points on a uh, typical intersection. On the right is the uh, conflict points on a roundabout. That's why on a roundabout, if there's any typical accidents, the accident you'll see will probably be uh, side swipes, but not P-bones or, or head-on crashes. So this is the Tulare 190 Reservation Road roundabout. It was open to traffic in 2017. This is t going towards the casino. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Eagle Mountain Casino. Y if you'll see, if you'll notice there is the uh, weaving pattern. This is this was constructed with a na Native American team. There's the weaving pattern around the apron that's supposed to represent an eagle. In the center is a fire ring that's supposed to represent also the Native American fire ring. And then we planted the uh, deer grass with, with the red, red hue. That's supposed to represent the uh, sacred fire. That's why this is, they could serve as gate, this is just an example of what could serve as gateways to communities. Just some uh, accident data on some constructed runabouts. So this roundabout was completed in February 2017. The, the before, accident, before construction accident data, we had eight, uh, eight accidents with five injury, injuries. After construction, we've had three accidents with no injuries. Uh, this was the accident data on the Kerman roundabout, 145 and Jensen, before construction. We had nine accidents, four injuries. Since it's since it's been open to traffic, we've had five accidents with one injury. And roundabouts are designed to accommodate trucks, large vehicles. This is just a list of the current program projects in Kern County. There are three on I-5 at Lebec Road, the one at 43, 119, and Enos was open in November 2019. The one at 43 in Stockdale, it's cur currently in construction. We have one proposed at SR 43 and Santa Fe Way, Los Angeles Street in Shafter. We have one proposed at State Route 43 and 46 in J Street in Wasco. The one at 155 in Browning that, that's been open. And we have one proposed at 184 and 223 at Willie Ridge by Arvin. Construction expected to start in 2020. And the one at 184 and Sunset Boulevard, that's, uh, south of Lamont, ex expected to start in 2021. This is the con conceptual drawing for the roundabout at uh, Los Angeles Street, Santa Fe, uh, Santa Fe Way, and Stock, uh, State Route 43 in Shafter. You can see it's a five-legged intersection, so it solves a lot of issues for the traffic there. This is a conceptual drawing. I don't know if you could see the layout of the 223184 roundabout. It's construction expected to start in 2020, 2022. And we'd like to express our appreciation for the COG board for uh, uh, allocating uh, CMAC money for this uh, project. This kind of advanced the construction timeline a little bit with the with that CMAC money. There is a, a potential or proposed roundabout at uh, Seven Standard and State Route 43. Uh, we are willing to partner with the local agency to to get this uh, roundabout off the ground. And then this is the proposed roundabout at sunset and 184, and this is a simulation.
With that, I can open, I'm open to any questions. Right. Uh-huh. We <laughs> There's one proposed there. It uh actually the cogboard allo allocated CMAC money for that and we were able to advance construction much sooner than expected with that city. No, it's sunset. By the school, you can see this is this is the one there by the school, and you can see the sign on the one of the corners there. You're using some CMAC funds for some of these. Uh, uh -huh. Would you go over some of the savings in in pollution because our cars are not sitting there idling? Did they have they calculated that? I think There's got to be a reduction because you're moving slowly versus sitting in. Right, I think part of the CMAC application where we showed the reduction in uh, uh, pollution because up, up there you don't, uh, on, a, on a signal in there, you sit and idle and you wait. Here you don't wait. Yeah, Paul, Paul I can expand on that. Okay. Uh, so uh, later on on the, on the agenda today, the board, if they choose, w will uh, adopt the CMAC projects for this two-year cycle. And there are two roundabouts uh, that are proposed for funding. One is the one near Arvin. One is the five-legged one in Sh Shafter. <laughs> and both those projects uh, competed very well in terms of demonstrating improved uh, um, air quality. Uh, and bec because they've scored so high, they're, they're being recommended for, for, for the funding that will come before you in about 15, 20 minutes. Does that answer your question, Council? Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask, we had been more or less told they w that Caltrans was considering one on, uh, we call it Garces Highway, but I forget the number, 155, 155 is it? 155, yeah. And uh, Lexington, because the cars get backed up so much, there is a lot of you know, congestion going on there, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the air quality, uh, but we never heard any anything concrete. Is it that it wasn't going to happen? I think I believe there is a proposed project there. It might be, it might be in the, in the upcoming shop cycle that's going to be voted on by the CTC soon. Well it now, might, it might be a 2020 project, I believe. Uh, but I think the project is uh, signal lights. I. I I'll, I'll bring up your question to the okay, to the project manager that. for that one. Yeah, and if if you can confirm, is it true? Because we were told signal lights now. Oh, I, well, I'll get back to you. Okay, Madam. thank you. By the way, I just want to say that the one on on 155 and uh, Browning, we had people say, "No, no, it's confu It's going to be confusing," and, all, and they love it. So, <laughs> and it works great. Actually, I heard some anecdote about the one at 119 and 43 uh, I, I know somebody who used to, who goes through there and he said he used he, he used to sit st st sit at the light waiting for the light he said now he loves it and he can't wait uh, because now he doesn't have to he goes through and he can't wait for the one at Stockdale and 43 to get built yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll, I'll bring that up with the project manager for that one what's th what's the cost of one of these <laughs> the one at one nineteen forty three, it came. The bid came in about four million. That's total cost. Well, just just construction cost. So a support cost would probably uh, you add another another two to three million for support cost. S so can I uh, add to that, uh, Mr. Sure. Chairman? S so some of these roundabouts are approaching ten million dollars. Th that that is not sustainable. Uh, as as you as all of you know, traffic signals are, are put in all around your cities. So um, obviously, roundabouts are a much better and safer solution. But uh, compared to a, say a quarter million dollar um, traffic signal, we we can't afford to put roundabouts at every intersection, and we, and we can't afford to continue to spend ten million dollars uh, on each on each roundabout and. Uh, we, n we 
need to work with Caltrans, work with our partners to get these costs down. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I have talked about maybe like a standard design for a, a four-legged intersection. I understand absolutely like a five-legged intersection like we have in Shafter is much more complicated. There's also the, the complications of how do you build it. The one in Delano, um, we actually closed it down and did it over the summer. It's right next to a school. That simplifies things greatly. So one of the things that complicates these is how do you stage traffic? If we could uh, get all parties to agree to completely close the intersection, these things can be built in just a month or two. Um, so th the they are very expensive. That, wa that wasn't uh, covered. We need to work on getting the costs down for these, and, and I'm confident that we can get the cost down. Great, thank you. Off the roundabout subject, but mm -hmm. uh, City of Bakersfield, we had a bicycle and pedestrian study presented to us at last night's City Council, mm -hmm. and Union Avenue is far and above the most dangerous corridor in Bakersfield. Uh, three times the fatalities, three times the accidents, uh, not just bike and ped, but cars also. So. I would like to encourage Caltrans to work on that corridor. Uh, you know, the, the city of Bakersfield is going to work on what they can, but most of it is Caltrans' right. responsibility. I think I got, uh, John Lu said that we're willing to partner with the city on, on a solution to that one. So Great. Kay. Well, I hope that gets put on a list. <laughs> Thank you. Any yeah, question here? Fox, I got two questions. One is over at Chester and 30th, we have a circle. Is that a roundabout with an attached homeless shelter? Or what was that to begin it's with? A, it's a traffic circle. It's not yeah, a I know. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say what happened years ago, and Caltrans had some guys experiment with, and it worked but it wasn't accepted. And that is, you mentioned deer grass. They got a hold of some fine blue grass that only grows about that high. And it stays green all year if you water it three times in the summer. Uses six inches versus 36 inches. And it, um, you don't mow it. Once a year you have to mow it to keep it healthy. And uh, it was during one of the energy, the droughts that we are seem to be having, but it was accept and it worked. And they did a 20 miles this side of uh, Sacramento on five. They did a clover leaf with it, and it worked. Did most of the stuff they wanted it to do, and it proved effective, maintenance and everything. However, there's objections to it is from the People might end up start putting that in their yards. It's not very good in rear yards because it doesn't grow fast, but in the front yards and where you look, it's okay. But there's the problem with minority employment because so if they, people start getting rid of that. Thank you. Sure. John Polaris. Um, as far as the uh, uh, Highway 43, 46, J Street, is that too close to the underpass that we have there by the railroad tracks? And also, uh, will your design uh, be accommodating for uh, two lanes each direction? I, I, I can take that, Councilman. So the uh, good question, first of all, that the roundabout that you're speaking of is, um, on the east side of where the underpass starts and and the design is being coordinated actively with the work that high speed rail is being is doing so what we're trying what caltrans is trying to do right now is um, give the money that they have for that roundabout to the uh, builders of high speed rail so they can build the roundabout 
and the underpass all in one project and coordinate it together. And I've been in touch with your city manager about that. Okay. Any other, any other comments? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Roll call. Garola. Crump. Here. Vallejo. Here. Cantu. Alvarado. Here. Scrivener. Here. Cryer. Here. Mauer. Here. P. Smith. Here. Garcia. Present. B. Smith. I'm here. Couch. Here. Lucinovich. Kiernan. Present. Farah. Here. Gordon. Here. And Green. Thank you. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification. Make a referral to staff for factual information or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Are there any public comments? Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in a listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. Anybody want anything pulled off consent agenda? Move approval. Second. Roll call vote. Crump. Aye. Vallejo. Aye. Alvarado. Yes. Fryer. Yes. Mauer. Yes. P. Smith. Yes. Garcia. Aye. B. Smith. Yes. Couch. Yes. Scrivener. Aye. Kiernan. Yes. Para. Yes. And Gordon. Yes. Thank you. Public workshop. Public comment. 2020-2050 growth forecast draft report. Good evening, Chairman, committee members. Uh, <clears throat> In a few minutes, I'll, I'll introduce our economists that Kern Cog worked with to develop the regional growth forecast. But first, I'll provide you with a uh, background of the regional growth forecast and, and where we're at and where we're, where we're moving forward with the growth forecast. Um, <clears throat> updating the regional growth forecast is one of the first steps in the preparation of the 2020 regional transportation plan. Is a countywide forecast creating control totals for countywide uh, pro projections in Kern Cog's transportation model. The RPAC, the Regional Planning Advisory Committee, provides oversight during this process and has been provided with updates throughout the project since we initiated the projects the project uh, last May. It's the 2020 to 2050 regional growth forecast. We update it every three to five years. 
and this year's a little special as well the 2020 census is coming out april 1st and that data will be available along with the uh, california department um, of finances Pro they, they update their projections based on 2020 census and that comes out um, in early 2021 so we'll be looking at doing uh, updating um, adjustments to this forecast next year but it's still the the first step in preparing to do our, our transportation modeling for the the 2022 RTP and one of the as we move forward, we'll be taking it to the, the Regional Planning Advisory Committee to review uh, distributing that control total to the rest of Kern County and, and how that gets divided based on all the, the city's projections. And then we move that even further forward into smaller geographies uh, at the, the transportation analysis zone level, which is what the uh, transportation model uses um, in projecting transportation uh, patterns and congestion in the future. So today um, is the public workshop. Uh, the public comment period began February 7th and will be closing uh, March 9th. Um, following public comments, we uh, anticipate uh, adoption in March. And then like I said, we'll be uh, uh, re revisiting it um, at the beginning of 2021 for the um, adjustments from the, the 2020 census and um, also be moving forward to um, distribute to what we call the regional statistical areas, the 10 geographies that the county's divided um, into um, at the, re the RPAC. We'll, we'll be working on, on that um, in the coming year. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Schneep, our econ economist who's going to provide a presentation of the regional growth forecast. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ben. Let's see. Okay. It's up. So I'm going to show you uh, a few things uh, about the forecast, particularly population. Our, uh, our full charge here was to uh, forecast all of these things. Uh, but uh, tonight, I'm not going to go through all that minutia because it'll just put you to sleep. So I'm just going to talk pr principally about population because that's going to be the most important component for the transportation model and also to get most of these other things anyway. So I'll talk about that, a little bit about employment too, and uh, I'll mention households. Uh, other than that, all the details of everything else can be found in our report. Okay, so we've had to produce a population forecast, and we find these things really critical. We, we forecast population for every county in the state, uh, and we've been doing that for quite a long time. So um, one of the things that's easy about population it's, is that it's an accounting identity. So if you know population last year, then you just get all the births that occurred since then, and you subtract all the deaths that occurred, and then you add on everybody that migrated in. And so you got the new population. Okay, that's an easy one. So it's critical, therefore, that you, know, you get a good forecast of births and deaths and net migration, because those are the three things that are gonna tell you what your population is, right? All right, so births and deaths, those two components, those are basically driven by age. Okay, the fertile age population, and then the older age populations, which are then vulnerable. So if you know the age distribution of the population, then you pretty much got a good handle on births and deaths, particularly if uh, fertility rates don't change too much. And then net migration is largely driven by economic factors, like is there jobs, is there housing, is the housing affordable, and is there income potential and opportunities that exist, okay? So all of those things were factored in to our migration estimate. And the first thing I wanna show you is the births and deaths forecast, because that's gonna be critical, of course, to this. So here's our forecast, CEF is in blue, and the Department of Finance forecast that was made last August and September 
for Kern County and births is in red. And you can see that the DOF here has a little bit higher births than we do going forward. But then just a few weeks ago, the Department of Finance came out with a brand new forecast, significantly more uh, bearish one, I should say. And this, is, this was their, their new birth forecast. You see, it's quite dramatic. <laughs> Quite dramatic, quite a departure uh, from uh, what they had originally been telling us all along. So um, let me show you uh, that in order for that to have occurred, you're going to have to lose a lot of fertile age population or they're just going to simply stop having kids. And it's the only way that could happen. So here's the population 25 to 44, which is, again, that's when most of babies are born and that 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 in that age group of the population from that age group and here's Kern County and I put California in there to show you that Kern County is actually increasing faster than California in terms of this age category the Millennials and then following up with generation Z okay so we know that the fertile age populations aren't going to decline so so the UF has to believe that Millennials are just going to stop having kids entirely, which I think is, we're seeing that to some extent, but I think that their forecast is just unreasonably too bearish. So if uh, here is births, the birth rate essentially, births over the population age 25 to 44, and that would be our birth rate. And you can see that it moves right in lockstep with California. Okay, moves right in lockstep with California. There's the new DOF forecast. It just deteriorates away. So again, DOF is, is assuming that the birth rate is going to drop precipitously over the next uh, 30 years. And we don't think it's quite going to do that, particularly if California is holding up. So why is Kern going to be different? It just doesn't make sense. Okay. So that's, that's, good of, that's why we believe in our forecast of births. Now, here's the forecast of deaths. You've got to subtract this out, you know to get to population. And uh, there's the old DOF forecast, which was made last August, September. And there's ours, CEF. And there's the new one. So they came out with a new one, and they added more deaths. All right? Uh, and get, got a little bit closer to us on this one. But we're still a little bit higher. Why are we higher? Because we have a little bit higher 75-year-old population for Kern going forward than DOF does. And why do we have it? Because it's more consistent with what we're seeing at the state level. Okay. Normally, it's really easy to get the age of the population because people have a bad habit of aging one year every year. And so you just extrapolate that out. The only wild card is how many people are coming in through migration that are going to end up in this age category. So th th that makes there's some room for error then because of that. So anyway, that's our births and deaths. The last component would be migration, okay, which is the biggest wild card normally. And here is migration <laughs> over time, net migration. That means the total number of in-migrants less the total number of out-migrants. That's what this is, going back 25, 26 years, okay, in Kern County. So I... Uh, you can see that in the most recent, say, 10 or 12 years, it's been relatively low. In fact, the average per year, when you look at the Department of Finance estimates for this, is about 520 people per year coming in. That's in minus out. All right? So not many. And if you take the long 25-year average, you get 4,031 on average per year. But you can see it was boosted up by what occurred during the early part of the 21st century there, leading up to the housing bubble and then ultimately the Great Recession. And by the way, that's the reason if we look at the most recent downturn in migration, right in that part, that's the Great Recession. So we know that that's probably real. But something else happened right there. What happened in 2014 to 2016 in Kern County that would have caused an out-migration to occur? Okay, and everybody says that. Everybody immediately goes to the fact that oil melted down, the oil prices melted down. 
and therefore so did the industry. But it was more than just that, okay? Let's talk about the 2014 to 2016 downturn because I think it has serious implications for the, the, uh, us that think about what migration is gonna be in the future. Oil prices tumbled during that time period and we saw jobs in oil and gas industry uh, uh, decline sharply. Okay? We know that's part of the record. In fact, here is the record, oil and gas extraction uh, jobs and uh, there's the tumble big time going into 2015, 2016 and then it has recovered some. Not much, but it has recovered. Okay, but there were other factors. So it wasn't just oil. There was more of a perfect storm scenario that occurred during this time in Kern County. You had a drought, okay. major California drought, and that caused farm employment to stagnate. In fact, it even went down in a few years. And employment in food manufacturing declined. And crop valuations declined. So that didn't help the job market, it didn't help migration coming in to find jobs because their jobs were really quite stagnant then. And then the other thing, DOD budgets declined sharply during that particular time period. And when DOD budgets declined, you had resulting uh, strength reductions and overall civilian reductions for that matter at China Lake and Edwards. So the combination of all these factors really accounted for that anomaly in migration that that lowered the curve. Here's a DOD budget. There it is, there's the big decline that occurred, 2014, 2015, 2016, but it's built up since then. And our forecast for the DOD budget, particularly if the current administration gets reelected, is gonna be a lot more optimistic going forward. And it's gonna be more optimistic for the two bases, the two large bases in, in the county as well. Okay, so our five-year outlook, by the way, is this. Stable to higher DOD budgets, which is gonna help out a lot of federal, civilian, and military employment. Significant construction employment boost. Look for that. You're gonna see a lot more jobs in construction. From the earthquake repair at China Lake, I don't know how many they're gonna to have to employ, but they've got $3 billion already appropriated to fix it. More energy projects coming down line. And then, of course, a lot more housing development, particularly at the bottom of the grade and then going up the grade. We don't see any change in oil and gas, pro the production profile, the trend in place. We're not making any assumptions about it melting down anymore. In fact, we see oil prices rising in line with the Energy Information Administration forecasts. They're kind of stable for the next few years and then they start rising. And that is what we have found to be the most statistically relevant factor for oil and gas employment is rising oil prices. Then you have the high-speed rail project. That's gonna cause be growth inducing for the county. So there's a lot of optimistic stuff happening down the pike for Kern County, okay? So our migration estimate after all that, that is our forecast in blue, all right? You can see it rising. In fact, it's rising right along the long 25-year average of about 4,000 per year. DOF was a lot higher than that. But again, then DOF changed their mind, came out with a new migration forecast two, three weeks ago. There it is. It's a lot closer to ours. A little, in fact, even a little bit less. Okay. Okay, now put all these scenarios together. We have births, we have deaths, we have migration. How does population look like in the forecast? Well, here's four lines. The top line is the forecast from the 2015 regional, regional growth forecast that you've been operating under and that fed into the transportation plan and everything else, okay? The red is the DOF estimate from last September. The blue is our current forecast. And the green is the new DOF revision. So it's following ours all the way up to about you know 2040 and then it's somewhat departures and goes down it's because that birth rate it's because of that draconian change in the fertility rates that they are assuming that's causing that departure anyway dof was at 1.35 million by the year 2050 we are at 1.23 and under the new revised dof they're at 1.17 so we differ by about 60,000 people in after 30 years and I think uh, their forecast is a little bit too bearish. 
at this point. Let me talk quickly about employment. I don't have too much more. Uh, we forecast all 20 industries in Kern County. And then the sum of all those industries give you total employment. That's all the industries that exist. Employment is principally driven by all the regional economic factors that exist in the county and by state and national factors as well. So all of those are in our model, our econometric model that we've been using to forecast Kern County for the last 19 years and have used that this time around as well. So here's our, here's our short-term forecast for oil and gas employment. You can see it really doesn't change too much. It hit these peaks here when oil prices were really high. Then it plummeted, as I showed you before, when oil prices melted down. But now oil prices have come back a little bit, and the forecast is for them to rise slightly, stable to slightly going forward. And so that's the estimate. We, again, we don't assume anything uh, out of the ordinary for oil and gas for, at the moment, not for the most likely scenario. And then just to show you some other forecasts that we made, I'll show you the longer term ones. This is what the longer term for construction looks like. You can see construction runs up because of, the, of some of the things that I've talked about, plus more, much more housing projects, plus high-speed rail project. So that's all feeding into this next 10-year forecast for construction, and then it starts to tail off after that. Healthcare has always been very important. You can see that historical run-up has been remarkable. That will continue because of the age demographics of the county and of the state. And then you're seeing a resurgence in the uh, professional business services and the technical employment, and we look for that to continue to increase over time. And also the, the other big industry here is leisure and hospitality. So uh, we have uh, the growth rate somewhat ebbing and flowing there. It's not quite as strong as it was during the history, but it still rises over time to accommodate a growing population. Total employment, when you add everything up, I just showed you a couple of the industries, not all 20, but uh, there's total employment. That's what it looks like over time. It's sustained all the way out to 2050. And here it is again, the blue line there. I've turned it into a line rather than a bar chart. So you could compare it with total employment that you had forecast in the 2015 regional growth forecast. That was the last one. And this is the current one right now. And it's come way down because population is a lot lower and other factors. In fact, here is, um, I'll get, get to that summary of those other factors in just a second. But real quickly for households, when you're going to forecast what households are going to be in the future, you have to have a pretty good idea of how you're going to forecast number of homes being built. So we do that in our models, and we do it based on economic factors and, and population and a variety of other things. So single family, multiple family permits for houses, those, that's our forecast going forward. It's not too much different than what's going on right now, but it is a little bit higher. For a single family, not much for a multifamily, but nothing like it was historically. So that's uh, going not, not got going to be as optimistic of a forecast. And then you feed those into the house number of households that currently exist now, and you move that forward. And the, our CEF estimate is in blue. The 2015 forecast before is in red. So again, much more austere austere forecast this time around for Kern County. So just to summarize, we have a more conservative forecast than 2015. Population growth is muted, principally due to more realistic projections of in-migration. Okay. We have less employment due to lower population and the onset of more automation in many of the workplaces that underscore a lot of these industries in Kern County. So automation will certainly replace workers to some extent. And then you have just the reduced number of households because you have reduced or lower projections of population. Okay, that's the summary I wanted to give you uh, and kind of wanted to show you for some of the key highlights of the forecast. So if you have any questions, I'm open for them. So again, just it's pretty drastically different from 2015. <clears throat> so what, what are the underlying factors that cause that change uh, growth is is a lot slower 
than we had originally than than what we had thought it would be back in 20 well we didn't do the forecast ours would ours would never have been that high to begin with but your consultant back then didn't uh, uh, assumed much faster growth based on uh, pre previous history, uh, and, and and at that time, uh, the consultant also probably couldn't see just what had happened with net migration and housing and a variety of other things. But now, uh, it, it's less cloudy, it's less blurry. We can see from history what has happened, and we can make a more realistic forecast this time around. So population growth is just a lot slower. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, fertility rates have changed, you know, significantly. Not quite as stark as some of those new DOF estimates are suggesting in the forecast period, but they have come down. Millennials are not having as many kids, you know, as Generation X did at that same age and as us boomers. Aren't, isn't Kern County still higher fertility rates than, than the state as a whole? Yes, slightly higher. And so we don't think that they're just going to deteriorate significantly suddenly. But nevertheless, we couldn't, we didn't account for that, or at least uh, many of the consultants didn't account for that back in 2014 when this forecast was prepared. Yeah, uh, one, one note, um, we, we looked at recovering from the oil, uh, the, the decline in oil sooner, um, and having I think I think the consultant at that time pr predicted a, a much uh, better um, recovery from that. So, it if you saw that that big dip um, that happened, we had it curving up a lot earlier. So there's a, a big drastic change just right there at, at where your starting off point is for the 2018 uh, forecast or the tw uh, 2020 forecast. <coughs> Minimum wage moving up, where you invest uh, businesses are hiring or, or going to automation. Yes, definitely. I talk about this all the time, Partic <laughs> particularly when I go into high schools and uh, give a lot of the kids uh, uh, an idea of what kind of fields they should be preparing for, and, and hopefully that their jobs that, that they're currently thinking about now aren't going to be replaced too quickly through automation. But yes, automation. Uh, is going to become much more uh, economical because uh, labor costs are going to be rising much faster with with minimum wages going up the way they are. So that is, it's going to have one of these unintended consequences that nobody ever wants, and that is, instead of providing more jobs at a higher wage, you're going to provide less jobs because more employers are going to be moving into automated or robotic kinds of capital. I, I can agree. We, we employ about 450 people, and we're going to more automation. In fact, we're looking at uh, eliminating another 200 seasonal workers for weeding out in the field because new equipment come out there for um, automatic uh, weed, weeding machines, robotics and stuff to, to pull the weeds out in the fields that we usually have uh, humans out there pulling them. So there's a lot of things happening because of the minimum wage. And another factor we're hitting right now is because at one time, Last year, we could work with workers 10 hours before we pay overtime. And because of some do-gooders and stuff, thought they were going to be helping the, the workers out. Sorry, they could have to, anything over nine hours now is um, overtime. Anything over 50 is overtime. And uh, so we had to cut the workers down to nine hours. Man, they're, they're looking at $150 to $200 a week less than a paycheck because of that one move on the hourly, hourly. so it's, it's, I know the workers are suffering right now, and, lo and unfortunately that's the case of the, in order to stay in business, or, or a business model in order to keep our doors open. Well, I know, we're, and we're, that's we're the, competing a general, with the world, you know. It's a general thinking across California right now that, we're, that you're, we're seeing that, yes. Are you using uh, automation, automation for harvesting? Uh, we do have equipment for that already, but working that uh, weed control, uh, we do a lot in our oranges. We have robotics in there to uh, pack the uh, oranges and grading different things. And, and even our carrots, the baby carrots, we're doing a lot of auto automation there. We eliminate a lot of people because we had to in order to stay in business, in, our, in order to stay in business and compete. But it's getting tough. Yeah, and we're seeing that in restaurants now, too. Uh, the chilies 
restaurants on the coast. They now use iPads to order from. Mm -hmm. and, and more of that is occurring now. So uh, you don't have a wait. The only waitress or waiter that shows up at your table is the one that's bringing you the food. Well, it's sad for the young folks because uh, it must be an entry-level uh, job to work. Now they're, now they're wanting the older people now because they're experienced. They want to they want to train somebody out of high school or, or college because uh, they don't have the experience, life experience to, to know how to work. So they're the ones that are suffering the most. Right. But you know, Generation Z, which is about everyone born since 2000, is is understanding that now. They see that writing on the wall. So what are they doing? That's why the STEM uh, majors are increasing rapidly in colleges and universities right now. They want to go into engineering and math and science fields and stuff like that because they know they're going to get their any job, other jobs are going to get automated away. So we're seeing this dramatic increase and a lot more functional, usable majors and not away from humanities and communications and things like that. The other last question I have is uh, on, a, on a birth part of it, I just don't think the millennials know how to have fun. <laughs> you know. well, I'll put that in the report. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> They're too busy playing on the So oh, I have a question for Mr. Akimi. So this obviously affects traffic modeling, future greenhouse gas reductions. Y yes, this this is the one of the 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 legs of our stool. It's one of the basis of, of how we forecast what traffic is going to be like. We consider population. We've considered jobs, land available. So the short answer is, is yes. It has a, a big impact on the uh, cycle that we're starting now, which is our 20-year look ahead. You know, how many buses do we need? How many trains do we need? How many lanes on the highways do we need? How much congestion will there be? And with all that, how much air pollution yeah, the, will the it be? The 20-year difference in those two graphs is amazing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you're, you're correct. Huh. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Fox, come to the microphone, please. Yes. Really interesting. Really fast. well done. And I have just two things, questions for you. One has to do with oil. And you're fracking, fracking. Oh, that's getting old. But, and it affects air quality. You, the oil, all they talk about is gas and pollution and air. And I would have called you, except I don't have a, my plastic little, uh, and I would buy it, buy a new one, but I don't even have a plastic credit card. We won't even have those. So I was wondering about the problem with, uh, is it a factor here for petrochemicals? And it seems like that's our age, no longer steel, it's plastic. And if that's an effect. Uh, the other one is, is Keynes, Keynesian economics and the Depression said that in 2020, we would have too many people for the jobs. And we're, that's the homeless people now. The advocates for them are coming up with, maybe we need to cut the hours like they did. They want to see three-day work weeks, which means if they don't, there's a lot of people are working three jobs. So if we cut it back, you have to raise it up with the income disparity, what are we going to do about that? You know, will that force the jobs overseas, even more, or robotics, or even more? Thank you. Two questions. So you got some questions there. Try that. <laughs> Future oil with the state wanting to do away with it, I think, was the first one, and and do do we move towards uh, shorter work weeks? Right. Uh, well, certainly, uh, the, the, a rapid deterioration or diminishment in oil and gas sector is a plausible scenario, but it's not the most probable case. That, that's the issue. We, 
we wouldn't want to build something like that into the baseline forecast because it's not likely to occur. I mean, certainly that is a scenario which could occur and we could run a scenario like that. But uh, the best forecast really of tomorrow is, is really what's happening today and, and extrapolating what's happening today. And, and uh, to assume anything else would be presumptuous. So no, we, we, we really can't uh, 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 incorporate a worst case scenario into the, into the base forecast. Right. The, the second question was a shortened work week. Do you see that? Well, you know, and you're, everything you said about that is right. Uh, we thought we'd be uh, replaced a lot more by robots by now. But it just so happens that uh, that robotic technology has not progressed like everyone had thought it would. The robots are still not agile. They're clumsy. They drop stuff. You know, they, they don't do what we had yes, thought that they would do uh, yes, with the kind of advancement that uh, we anticipated 20 years ago. And look at today. Even with all the automation that we have going on today, we have a, a major demand for jobs. Our unemployment rate's the lowest it's ever been in the history of the world right now. We've got more job openings than ever before in the history of the world. Uh, the, the employer's nightmare is recruiting. So here at 2020, uh, we have a real difficult time with labor. It doesn't look like the, 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 the job situation is going to get any better anytime soon. Now, in the next 10 or 15 years, yes. But you see these population estimates. We're not generating as much population anymore. There's not going to be a lot of workers that we're going to need to really think about employing because we're, I think that they're just going to be growing just at the rate enough to fill the jobs that will remain in the economy. That normally has what's happened in the past, and we're likely to see that occur now. So look for population rates to continue diminishing along these lines. That's why the forecast is so different from 20, from the last time, just in 20 years. And I think that you're going to see the labor markets assimilate the population in a reasonable and equitable fashion over time. I don't think there's going to be catastrophic unemployment. We're going to create a lot of jobs. I mean. Robots are going to take over a lot of jobs, but we need programmers to program the robots and to maintain them. We're going to be creating all kinds of new jobs you never saw before. Did you talk about uh, or back, uh, the closing of the prisons in California into their into your numbers? Like they're going to close down all, most of the CCFs, including our, our own uh, here within some time, and all the ones in our county and uh, another uh, and up and down the state. Did that well, we in. We don't have outright closure in, uh, closures of prisons, but we have a diminishing inmate population gradually occurring over time, as part of the uh, uh, as part of the the uh, non-household population, the institutionalized population that feeds into our forecast. That's so, good. again, that would be another scenario officer. in which <laughs> we could run. But again, it's probably not likely that we're just going to get sudden prison closures, and I wouldn't want to build that into your base forecast. But we do have a diminishing incarcerated population, certainly. I think that, that was the key word, incarcerated, because the changes in laws and, and uh, the crime are committed. It's just keeping them out of being incarcerated. So our crime on the street is still there, and it's building because the prison population is diminishing because they're out on the street. So it may require more jobs, jobs <laughs> in the end. But, but, but again, <laughs> Sorry. I think Shafter and Taft MCCFs are 2021 and we're 21, 22 in Delano because there's only three MCCFs in the state of California. That's less jobs affecting families and vendors, you know, everybody that it ripples around. Well, we'll be watching that. 
and it will have time to be able to uh, probably make adjustments in the next forecast, you know, uh, that's in what, three to five years, whatever the case may be. Because even if that occurs in 2022, it, it, it's not gonna cause an episodic drop in the incarcerated population. It'll probably start very slowly and there'll be a gradual diminishment. But we're, it's a wait and see game. It, and a lot of it's politically motivated, right? And the politics ticks can change over time. So it's very hard to incorporate something that's going on right now that's a political decision when that can all change in five years. Okay, thank you. Very interesting, okay, appreciate it. Thank you. So no action, that was information only. Caltrans report. Thank you. Um, better? <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to first off start by thanking the board for the um, $2.8 million from the CMAC funds for the Shafter and Arvin roundabouts. Um, we really appreciate the partnership. Um, and also Aaron and I have been talking about support costs on roundabouts as well, standard plan designs. And also if we can close and build them, that's the most efficient. Uh, let's see, on, on uh, Route 204 uh, Union, you had some concern Caltrans um, is willing to participate uh, for the bike lanes. Um, we'd, we would like to work in partnership with the city to take the, if the city could take the lead in enacting parking restrictions, um, Caltrans could either do a minor job or um, perhaps encroachment or co-op to get some bike lanes out there on 204. And I have a, the plan here if anybody would like to see it. I, I was under the under the standing that the city is doing a complete streets on this area. I just had seen a presentation last night, but it was a very short portion From of Union Avenue. Okay. So, you know, the, the substantial <laughs> amount of the corridor is still left that the city's not doing anything on. Okay, so we would be looking at more, right. increasing it. So, so, so Laura, can I interrupt you and Mr. Chairman? So, uh, did, is it can the city restrict parking on a state highway? Is, is that what you said? Yeah. Is. Yeah. W w that was from John. Is that uh, the city take the lead in the enacting the parking parking restrictions? And that. Um, we we could we could uh, put a minor and then we would uh, maintain the striping and the signs. Yeah, uh, I, I, I I'd be glad to to set up a meeting with City Bakersfield, us and and Caltrans because we're we're very interested in in improving Union Avenue and we did not realize that the city had the option to uh, change parking on a state highway. Absolutely, anything uh, again. The, the fatalities and the injuries are way above any three other street. T three times as high three I've read done now. Right. Uh, any other street in Bakersfield and, uh, you know, whatever we can do to make that safer. Okay. I will. Forward. I have an action item I'm adding to set up a meeting with Caltrans in the city and with Aaron, and we can discuss it further because Great. we are very interested. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> the draft 20... The draft 2020 shop is out for comments and due in May. We had an extension uh, due to um, changes in, in our own internal changes. So, so instead of March, it's due in May. But in an effort to be better partners in the future and work collaboratively, uh, Michael Navarro will be reaching out to the COGS and setting up me meetings in March to go over the 2021 shop plan and we hope to do that in the future so that we can work more in tandem together. Um, then on Highway 99, uh, approximately Panama to Beersley Canal, um, there was question on the landscape there. We do have a project coming up, but that's gonna wait until the majority of the construction's done so we don't, um, plus I don't even think they could get in there right now, but so that is on the forecast to be done. And then we are almost complete with a settlement agreement and corrective action plan for the city of Arvin. I reviewed it with Aaron and that should be coming. We had a couple of 
typos that needed to be fixed. On uh, Route 46, uh, the conventional Highway 4A segment out there at near I-5, um, the contractor there, as you know, is working on several jobs in the area, and they have a tendency to move from job to job that is still scheduled for completion in June 30th, 2020. And um, we have a 55 hour closure at the end of February scheduled for Kern nor a five northbound off ramp to get some major work done. Um, the zero uh, Q 280, the 99 rehab, um, we expect to open Olive Avenue in mid March. So that hopefully will help. Um, Bell Terrace is moving along. That's uh, right there at the 5899 interchange with the walls they're putting in. They're actually ahead of schedule on there. That one with 53% uh, of the time complete, but we've got 63% of the work done. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, Cottonwood uh, uh, Gap Closure Rehab at 99 and 58. Uh, we estimate opening the westbound Cottonwood on-ramp and Union off-ramp in April. So that was well anticipated. And last on my list, I have we actually at the Union off-ramp at westbound 178. They hit a, hit a sewer line yesterday. So it is closed. Uh, we're working uh, closely with the city of Bakersfield to get that repaired. And we are going to put flaggers out there. We're going to try to get it low flow tomorrow, that repair, and we're going to put flaggers out there for the safety of the public while we do that work. And Where was that again? That's uh, 178 and Union. So the Union off-ramp at 178, westbound 178. Westbound 178. Yeah. They're putting in, they're installing some rock blankets. So, yeah, so it wasn't anticipated, it wasn't shown on the plan, so we had it. Because that dives off there, I guess it was pretty shallow, so. And that's all I have for today. Is there anybody have any questions for me or anything they'd like? I do have some action items I have. Uh, uh, to, you want to confirm if there was a signalized or roundabout at 155 in Lexington? Um, City of Bakersfield, Union Avenue, three times of, oh, uh, we're going to set up a meeting for that. And I need to send the roundabout presentation to Aaron because it says it's too big to take. So that's my action items, unless anybody has anything else for me. I'm me, sorry, did you yeah. say, because you set the lights in 155. No, Lexus, you wanted to verify if it was signalized or roundabout. Yes. Yes. And it is signalized. No, no, no. I need to verify. Oh. That's, that's my action item is to verify to you what it is okay because when you went into that bakersfield description i go wait a minute what happened to us okay i'm sorry <laughs> that's okay thank you miss Parr. that um that area at union mm. is a area world where a lot of the fatalities are uh -huh. is an area where the get buses are we have some routes that go through there so whatever caltrans and the city when they meet it's going to affect what our routes are going to be so i would like to make sure that um we coordinate with you we as coordinate well coordinate with get um and i mean and a lot of it well not a lot but sometimes it's our passengers getting off the bus and wanting to you know cross right there where the bus stop is so i think having get be a part of the partnership i think makes sense thank you noted can I, can I add uh, a little bit to that, uh, Mr. Sure. Chairman? So, so that in the presentation that, that I saw and, and you saw yesterday, there was a discussion about um, w um, impaired uh, driving. I, I believe there's also people driving vehicles that are impaired. I believe there's also an issue on union of impaired pedestrians and impaired bicyclists. But what I've been able to gather so far uh, has been that there are, is a lack of records on that. If Laura, if you could look into that, um, mm -hmm. uh, w whether s how many of the accidents are being uh, 
caused or the likely cause has to do with impairment of the pedestrian and the uh, and or bicyclist too, N not just the, the drivers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have, since you're mm -hmm. taking requests, I have one <coughs> that's been a problem for a long time, but getting close. 24 streets getting ready to be finished construction-wise, and, and we completed Rosedale Highway improvement some time ago. <coughs> and when we did Rosedale Highway, we added not officially a bike lane, but we have a six-foot stripe for the part that was in the city and the county. And the part that is still under Caltrans, I believe it starts at Mohawk and goes east. There's no striping. And then obviously when you get to the interchange, there's no direction for cars or bicycles. And if Caltrans could do a project where, you know, I don't, I don't know if we need Cheryl's, we need green striping in places so that bicyclists are guided okay so down Mohawk Rosedale to down that is the main corridor to downtown right so Mohawk, Mohawk uh, east 24th to Mo Mohawk to the east there's no striping it doesn't continue correct and then at the intersection or interchange interchange mm -hmm. at you. 99 and 58 yeah I Go think all, all the way to Oak Street would Right, all the way to oh, across the bridge to Oak is and then where the city begins. Uh, there's there's a bike lane on Oak, and there's also ties to the bike path. But you're you're kind of in no man's land from Mohawk to Oak Street. Yeah, that's a pretty busy interchange too. Right. Kay. So it would help. I will add that to the topic when we're talking about 204. Then. Thank you. Thank you. I have, uh, I want to confirm something now. You said that cities have the authority to restrict parking along the, because we have that 155, which people think it's our road, but we can literally restrict it even though it's Caltrans, it's a highway. I, I'm, I'm writing it down to check into. What he had said is on, if we do this bike striping that the, on union that the city take the lead in the parking restrictions but i will ask the general question does the city can can a city any city right right restrict <coughs> parking parking yeah because all of our cities except cal city have have a, a state highway running through them <coughs> right. at least one state highway yeah i mean even a safety thing we have to beg and ask and ask before it can be fixed. I can't believe that we can restrict. Uh, well, I will definitely ask the question and get it back to Aaron to share. <laughs> I want a commitment in writing. Then, then Council maybe member if you tell him you're putting a bike lane in. <laughs> she already has her bucket of red paint ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get them, get those signs up fast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank District you. 9? No. Come to the microphone, please. I thought I was getting off the hot seat. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, it's not that bad. Uh, a few months ago, I, I had asked a request on a timeline to help me uh, with the uh, protected left turn in Wasco, the Griffith Street and Highway 46, and 46 and Palm Avenue. 46 and Palm. A haven't they had meetings out there? I haven't heard of anything. It, they may, may, may not. I, I do not know. And additionally, uh, the new. So it was 46 in Palm, and where was the, and 46 in and Griffith. And this is the crosswalks. Uh, this is protective left turns. Right now, it's unprotected. And. Uh, Representative uh, Garcia, um, what was the other one? Was it Poplar and 46 for a stoplight? Yes, Poplar. Okay. New school to the north, um, we have a lot of um, students, tra tra walkers, pedestrian traffic um, that are just kind of jetting across the highway, and you guys are. Uh, you yeah, guys there's are a aware sports sports center there too. 
Um, yeah, the well, the middle school is yeah, right, right in line with that with that um, intersection, and okay. that's um, usually pretty busy as well, especially after school as well. Yeah, and then going home as well. Yeah, Ma- Mayor Garcia, uh, I've been talking with your city manager and Caltrans Maintenance. Um, they they are on it. They they are doing a study, and they be- initially believe that a hawk is justified. And and uh, I can forward you the the emails back and forth. They're getting closer. Uh, so, okay. but they they absolutely want don't want to go in there without consulting with the city and the school district. And I I believe, I believe what we're waiting for now is. We want to see each school has to prepare what's called the safe routes to school plan. We don't want to put something in, in that is place. going to um, conflict with where the school uh, wants the sc- students to cross. Well, due diligence makes sense. So. so, yeah, they have had several meetings out there. Okay. Um, and do you have any word on the, I know there was, there's going to be a closure because the high speed rail at Pozo, um, the, the crossing on Pozo just east of 43 or j and um that's going to cause a diversion to down down j street or 43 um the, the what we're asking for is a temporary stop there um i believe the initial w- um, reaction from caltrans was that it's not warranted um but we we feel differently um i just wanted to reemphasize that and i would like maybe if um caltrans maybe take a second look at that um, because we, we, I mean, that's going to be a temporary closure, and that's all we're asking for is a temporary stop. But it is going to be through September. That's that's through, it's going to be a lot of traffic. I will take that back. I know we were looking at that just the other day. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you very much. Very helpful. Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. I have uh, about a half dozen items. I'll be quick. January 29th and 30th, I attended the CTC meeting. Uh, Main highlights are there's a new Executive Director. Uh, His name is Mitch Weiss. He replaced Susan Branson at the California Transportation Commission. And the um, commissioner that has informally represented the uh, Valley, who has visited with us in the past, Paul Van Kenninenberg, his term expired February 1st, and he has not been reappointed yet. Um, I've written a letter of support, uh, as well as many um, in the Central Valley, urging his his reappointment. He has been good for the uh, Central Valley. So if there's anything you can do um, to encourage the governor or the governor's uh, office to re-impo- reappoint uh, Mr. Van Kenninenberg, it would be appreciated. On February 6th, um, STIP hearing was held in um, Irvine. We had a staff member there, Mr. Stramaglia. Um, if you remember, this, the, we had a uh, disagreement with the uh, Newsom administration over taking funds away from 99 and 46. The funds were fully restored to 99 and uh, almost all of it restored to 46. Thank you for your help with that. On March 25th and 26th, the CTC will be meeting in Santa Barbara. We will have staff there. Two um, very important projects, bike path extension down to Buena Vista and the bike sharing project for Bakersfield will be on the CTC agenda. Um, Wednesday of this week, in fact yesterday, um, Mr. Snoddy and Ms. Banuelos um, went out to Cal City and assisted Cal City with getting caught up on their TDA claims. And I know, especially for some of the smaller cities with with uh, higher turnover, catching up on your uh, TDA claims uh, can can make a big difference in terms of cash flow. And w- we will we be glad to assist anyone else that needs that that's help. Um, at the February Get Board meeting, I want to congratulate and bring your attention to Get's plans to purchase 22 renewable compressed natural gas buses, f- five renewable compressed natural gas buses for their ride service, that's the on-demand service, and I think the first ever in Kern County, five hydrogen f- fuel cell buses for fixed routes. On top of that, I wanted to remind everyone that Kern Transit received um, 
last year an electric bus from Antelope Valley Transit. They plan on putting that into service in eastern Kern County shortly. Um, that's all I have on this agenda, subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, we're going to adjourn that meeting and open up the Kern Council of Governments meeting. Roll call. We're just minus couch. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Public comments again. Uh, same information. Any public comments? Seeing none, consent agenda opportunity for public comment. Seeing none, we, we have a staff comment on the consent agenda. Uh, good evening, Mr. Sorry. Chairman. Uh, we have a slight we have a slight revision to the recommended action for uh, consent agenda item F. Uh, we're requesting that this item be authorized uh, subject to some minor revisions and subject to final approval as to form by County Council. Thank you. Does any member wish to pull anything off consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a motion with motion <coughs> with staff's changes? Roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Fire. Yes. Crump. Aye. Vallejo. Aye. Alvarado. Yes. Mauer. Aye. P. Smith. Yes. Garcia. Aye. And B. Smith. Yes. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman and Board Members. As a reminder, the 2019 Kern Cog Regional Awards Ceremony will be held March 5th, which is only a couple of weeks away at Seven Oaks. You can still um, get tickets. Please call me or Veronica. Mar again, March 5th, Seven Oaks in Bakersfield. March 10th and 11th is the Valley Voice trip to Sacramento. Supervisor Scrivener and Council Member Prout and I will be attending that. April 5th to 7th, CalCOG is holding a regional leadership forum in Riverside. If you're interested in attending that, please let me know. What's the date on that again? Four, five, April 5th through 7th. That's May 13th okay. to 15th is the Let annual San Joaquin Valley Policy Conference in Bass Lake. Oh. Again, please let me know if any of you would like to attend that one. Uh, again, I'll remind you, your Form 700s are due April 1st, you can use the exact same form that you turn into your city. There's a separate line for additional duties just be below the heading where you say you also serve as a Kern Cog board member and just put a fresh signature on it and that will work for us. In your folders this evening, is a flyer for um, transitions uh, workshop being hosted by Kern Cog Thursday, February 27th at Hodel's. An article on um, a change that has been uh, almost 20 years in coming to um, allow people to purchase tickets on Amtrak even if it does not contain a, um, a train trip. This, this will mostly affect Bakersfield and, and Wasco. You used to have to buy tickets from Wasco depending on where you were going. Uh, you will no longer have to have to do that within the next year. Schedule. It says, I'm sorry. It says to Santa Barbara and Victorville. What yeah, about I if you're going to L.A.? So, so uh, the organization that is running uh, the Amtrak in the Central Valley is rolling it out um, route by route. Those are the mm -hmm. first first two routes they are implementing. Those are obviously lower volume routes than Bakersfield to L.A. They want to get it right first on the lower volume routes. Uh, they've assured me that all of their routes, and there's, I think, well over a dozen, uh, will be implemented within the year. Okay. So, so if you want to go to L.A., 
you it's still have to buy system. either from Wasco or to Orange County un until this is fully implemented. Oh. Okay. Schedule of uh, cash disbursements for January. Timeline covering February through May. Uh, current Council of Government's news and events. And um, just I think it was last week or within the last two weeks, um, Air Resources Board met in Shafter, believe it or not. And there's an article on, on the actions that they took uh, meeting in Shafter. Subject to any of your questions, Mr. Chairman and board members, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any member statements? We do have a birthday in the house. <laughs> Happy birthday, Miss Para. <laughs> Thanks for coming, uh, spending your birthday with us. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Adjourn. Thank <laughs> you.